Tis the season for Halloween. For horror fans, there's no holiday they look forward to more. From its humble beginnings as part of a Celtic harvest festival, the event has gone on to encompass all of the month of October and has evolved into a massive industry. Each year, over $8 billion is spent on Halloween in the form of horror movies, trick-or-treating, and of course, haunted attractions, also known as haunted houses. Over 35 million people go to haunted houses each year looking to immerse themselves physically into horror. Bobby Rowe is an actor, writer, and director from Dallas, Texas. He and his best friend Zach Andrews grew up together as horror fans. Every weekend in October, they'd go see a horror movie and then followed up by going to a local haunted house. This became a tradition that they took very seriously, and it continued for years. He studied history and film at UCLA, where he became an All-American pitcher for the Bruins. During this time, he realized his true passion wasn't baseball, but rather filmmaking, specifically horror films. He quit the sport and went to Loyola Marymount University for graduate film school. While finishing school, Bobby and Zach became writing partners who worked at hammering out horror scripts. They sold some over the years, but were irritated that none of them were ever made. They felt the scripts they were writing were different from the constant stream of horror films that kept being greenlit and became frustrated that the studios were refusing to try something new. They were annoyed, but rather than complain, they decided to do something about it. The duo remembered the numerous horror houses they had been to over the years and realized no one had ever done a proper film about them. They brainstormed ideas and the initial concept came from an unusual place. Most people know the philosophical question, if a tree falls in the forest and no one is around to hear it, does it make a sound? Everyone knows the answer but can't prove it. They decided to present the Halloween version of this. Have you ever seen a dead body in a haunted house? You can't definitively say that you haven't. With haunted houses becoming more and more popular each year, some of them started going to greater lengths to compete. There were rumors of extreme haunts, haunted attractions that kept going further and further into a gray area to scare their customers. One of the biggest urban legends was haunted houses using real dead bodies in their attractions. Initially, these were just stories, but as time went on, evidence was coming forward that some of the tales were, in fact, true. In October of 1990, a teen that worked at a haunted house in Lakewood, New Jersey, accidentally hung himself. His body hung there for some time without anyone knowing. The London Dungeon's Creepy Crypt exhibit had been displaying a real skeleton to audiences since it opened in 1975. While filming at an amusement park in Long Beach, California, the crew of the TV show The Six Million Dollar Man discovered a real corpse in one of the attractions. A crew member thought it was a mannequin and accidentally broke its arm off, which revealed bone underneath. The story became a featured segment on the HBO series Autopsy in 1996. Bobby and Zach took this concept and ran with it. They spent the next several weeks working on an outline for the film. The script they came up with was about a group of friends shooting a documentary where they went in search of the most extreme haunts. This was all happening in the late 2000s when extreme haunts were still mostly just a myth. They decided they wanted to make it seem realistic, so they opted to film it like it was an actual documentary. This was back in 2009, and found footage films hadn't begun to flood the market yet. They contacted Jeff Larson, a friend from film school. He was one of the few they knew from there who liked and respected horror. After describing the idea, he joined the group. Next, they looked into how they were going to pay for the film. They wanted to have full control, so they decided to produce it themselves. Taking a page from Kevin Smith with how he got the money to make Clerks, they proceeded to max out their credit cards in order to finance the production. It was a bold move they were hoping would pay off. In keeping with the style of shooting a documentary, they wanted to film it in standard definition rather than HD. This was a decision that would later come back to haunt them. While working on a title, they tried to think of the best way to describe what the film was. Yankee Stadium was referred to as the house that Ruth built. New Line Cinema was the house that Freddie built. So it seemed the best way to describe haunted houses was the house's October built. When it came time for casting, they decided in order to keep with the realistic vibe of the documentary, the two most important factors were anonymity and chemistry. Since Bobby, Zach, and Jeff were all friends, they cast themselves. Bobby hired his brother Mikey, who he used to make home movies with when they were younger. At the time, Mikey was hosting Feed the Beast on Travel Channel, so he knew he'd be fine in front of the camera. For the lead, they brought in Brandy Schaefer. Brandy was a dancer who had some small parts on shows like Ally McBeal, so this would be her first lead role. She was the first and only person considered for the part. She was a longtime friend of both Bobby and Zach, and was more than capable of being able to put up with living with the group for a month. Most importantly, though, Brandy had a natural charm and was their perfect weapon to disarm the people they interviewed to delve further into the haunt community. 
They rented an RV and began to travel to various haunts across Texas. As a way to save money and to keep everyone in character, the cast also worked as the crew. While they did have a script for the film, it was loose enough to allow for ad-libbing. The basic outline was this. The group would go from location to location, with Brandy interviewing both the patrons and the staff of the various haunted establishments. When working with the cast, they knew the beginning and the end of the scenes, but many times what was in between wasn't scripted. They decided to take a very unique angle with the film, the Borat approach to horror. They managed to tell the narrative through unsuspecting, real people. All the interviews in the film were genuine. The people being interviewed weren't actors and the responses weren't scripted. Bobby stayed off camera and used back signals to Brandy, which let her know what questions to ask and where to lead the conversation. Although more often than not, the people they interviewed went off on tangents that were crazier than anything they could have written. Choosing to talk to real people instead of actors ended up giving them better stories and added to the feeling of realism. One of the people they interviewed was Kurt Raymond, a professional wicked witch impersonator. He'd been doing haunts for years and had plenty of stories to tell. One such story was about a guy who Raymond worked with who supposedly murdered his parents and wrote about it on social media. They pressed him on the issue, but he refused to give out any more information. After the interview, they did some digging and discovered the story of Brandon Menard. He worked in an attraction and wrote on MySpace the details of how he was going to murder his parents. Every night he came home from the haunt wearing his costume until one day he stabbed his parents and his 16-year-old sister to death. The story was reported on locally, but it never gained nationwide coverage. The scene in the film where the cast discovers the Menard story is real and shows their initial genuine reactions. They were shocked a story this horrifying never made it to something like 60 minutes. The haunted houses were all real locations. Once again, in keeping with the realism, they wanted to use places where the audience members themselves would be able to go. In fact, considering their target viewers, many most likely already did. They knew if they made sets, they wouldn't have had nearly the authenticity of the real thing. Also, it would have been beyond the scope of what their budget could handle. Shooting in live locations meant they had to be more flexible than on a closed set. As such, there were things that were outside of their control. For example, filming in the haunted houses was difficult, but getting the audio was near impossible. Taking a boom mic through the houses wasn't an option, so they used lapel mics on the cast. One night while filming in Terraplex in Mansfield, Texas, one of the owners told them about an area where they couldn't film because their batteries would die. They thought this was just them trying to be spooky, so they started filming. Within five minutes, all their batteries were dead. They shot there earlier in the day and everything was fine. They still have no idea what caused it. Oddly enough, this was the location where one of the owners admitted to having real body parts in the haunt. As the film progressed, the group traveled from place to place, and in the end, they find what they're looking for, the most extreme haunt. They wanted to put the audience in there with the cast, so they shot the finale in almost complete darkness. The idea was that anything the audience was afraid of could be there. Filming ran through October of 2010. After filming, they moved into post. Unlike how some of the people in the movie appear, most everyone they encountered was genuinely nice and was thrilled to talk about the haunts. After editing the film, they shopped it around to potential distributors. It was now 2011, and the Paranormal Activity series had exploded onto the scene. While it wasn't the first found footage film, it was the one that rekindled interest in the genre. From 1980 to 2009, there had only been 49 found footage films, but now there had been over 40 in less than two years, from 2009 to 2011, with more on the way. Because of this, while they were shopping the film around, they were met with similar questions. When does the ghost show up? Where's the paranormal stuff? The producers kept waiting for jump scares and otherworldly things, but it wasn't that kind of movie. Bobby and Zach grew up on slow burn horror films, and they wanted to keep the houses October built in that vein. They had influences stemming from Alfred Hitchcock and Wes Craven, as well as more recent directors like James Wan with the original Saw. By shooting this as a fake documentary or mockumentary, they wanted the audience to question whether or not what they were watching was real. By keeping it within the realm of possibility, that made the end result more effective. The film was set to screen at Shockfest in November of 2011. They got a call telling them their film would open before Eli Roth was to receive the Shocking Filmmaker of the Decade Award. The film screened to a sold-out audience. Bobby and Zach stood in the back watching the audience reactions. For the last 15 minutes, the audience was dead silent. They were convinced that what they were watching was real. Bobby decided to keep the ruse alive, so after the film, he canceled a Q&A they were going to have with the audience and hid in the projection booth. He thought it would have ruined the illusion if the crowd saw them and preferred to leave their fates up to the audience's imagination. 
Each audience member was given a glow stick and had to exit the theater in complete darkness, just like the characters in the movie. Rumor had it that Rob Zombie saw the film and was so intrigued by the rise of extreme haunts, he hired Steve Kopelman, the owner of HauntedHouse.com from the movie, to run all of his Great American Haunts across the U.S. A few nights later, Zack received a call from Steven Schneider, producer of Insidious and the Paranormal Activity films. He saw the film and loved it. He said, This is the first movie I've seen that's real, until it isn't, but I can't tell you exactly when it switched. He then began to work with them on distribution. They had the movie scheduled to appear in more film festivals, but they pulled it from all of them so they could keep it a secret. This was the beginning of the evolution of The House's October Built. Now working with Schneider, 20th Century Fox and New Regency bought the rights to the film. They liked everything about it, except that it was shot in standard definition. And the sound wasn't all that great. Getting the film up to standards to be shown in multiplexes would have been complicated, so it was decided that the better option would be to remake it. They wrote a new outline for the film, which changed the structure of the original. The first film was treated as the blueprint, and the remake would take the good they learned from it and jettison the bad. They decided to reuse the interview footage they had and would interject that in with the new material. They also decided to recast themselves instead of bringing in new actors. This could be the only instance in which a film is remade using the exact entire cast of the original. The main difference in the cast was Bobby and Zack decided to switch characters for the remake. Zack was now the one leading the documentary. With the additional funds from the studio, they were able to get a crew, as well as a bigger RV. Having a full crew proved to be both good and bad. The good was that it allowed the group to focus on the more creative side of things, rather than the technical. The bad was that it was harder to work with the logistics of a full crew. Essentially, it was easier to move around five people, not so easy to move 50. Once again, the majority of the film was shot across Texas, but this time there were also parts shot in California and Louisiana. The Louisiana segment was filmed at Bourbon Street on Halloween night. Since the cast had already done this movie once, they were much more comfortable with it, and the ad-libbing flowed easier. Beyond that, they wanted to extend some things that were only touched on in the original. In the few years since they shot the first movie, times had changed. Extreme haunts were becoming more well-known, so they made some alterations for the new version. In the first film, they kept hearing about something called the Blue Skeleton. The Blue Skeleton was a play on the notorious Yale Club, Skull and Bones. The group was a secret society made up of people all over the globe. They decided to shift the focus onto finding the ultimate extreme haunt, instead of the search for a dead body within a haunt. They wanted a calling card for when the Blue Skeletons arrived. So when the groups in the bar and the clown comes in, the jukebox plays the 1960s song Halloween Spooks from the jazz trio Lambert, Hendricks, and Ross. They also wanted a unique look for when the Blue Skeletons were filming. They tested with shooting an 8mm, but that didn't work. Night vision was done to death, but it seemed to make the most sense with what they were doing. They decided to shoot it in night vision, but tinted it blue to keep with the theme. They added new characters like the masked child Porcelain as a way to interject more moments of horror into the film. Filming on Bourbon Street on Halloween was its own nightmare. Trying to work with the actors, get their shots, and control the crew was difficult to say the least. Not to mention the problems with getting audio. Still, it was essential to get the shots, and the end result was worth it. They wouldn't have been able to recapture the event in all its chaotic glory in a studio. While deciding on the ending, they wanted to keep the open ending of the first, but do it in a different way. The inspiration for the ending came from an unusual place. The last place you would expect. The Karate Kid. With The Karate Kid, the ending of Part 1 lined up perfectly with Part 2. You could watch them back-to-back -back seamlessly, despite them being years apart. With this in mind, they decided to film in a way that was an intentional cliffhanger that would be immediately picked up in part two. After filming, once again, they moved into post. With so much footage, they now had two films to combine together into one. Editing this together wasn't easy and resulted in a few different versions. They even went back to film some additional scenes for about two weeks. Now with all the footage, they edited together the final cut. It was now 2013 and found footage films that saturated the market. With the film going for slow burn horror rather than a constant stream of jump scares, the studio dropped it. Without a studio behind it, the movie was now in limbo. They shot it around, and after a very long eight-month search, the film was picked up by RLJ Entertainment. The new version of The House's October Built premiered at the Telluride Horror Show in Telluride, Colorado. There was a huge buzz around the film, and it was the first ever to sell out the Sheridan Opera House. After that, they took on the global market. They were nervous when the film played overseas because many of the countries don't celebrate Halloween like in the U.S. The film played at the Sitges Film Festival in 2014 as part of the Midnight Extreme category, where it ended up winning the Best Feature-Length Film. 
With the win at Sitges, they were asked to have the film premiere in the UK at the prestigious Edinburgh International Film Festival. The movie was a hit, and the group was flown overseas and asked to speak with the haunt owners from London. This brought even more attention to the film, and it ended up being shown in theaters all over the world. The film played in five continents and did very well in finding its audience, so RLJ greenlit the sequel. The sequel is currently shot and set to release in September of 2017. Like previously mentioned, the sequel will pick up right where the remake left off. Bobby outlined four movies for the series, each one a continuation of the story of the film before it. For the sequel, they want to expand the scope to showcase more of the haunt community. There's so much going on within the community, and part one was just them scratching the surface. For part two, they filmed in Anoka, Minnesota, the Halloween capital of the world. They also filmed in Minneapolis, where they held the largest gathering of zombies in history, over 30,000. They even have a segment where Kobayashi, the hot dog eating champion of the world, has a brain eating contest. The sequel will continue Brandy's story, the impact of the Blue Skeletons, and how all of this will change the haunt industry forever. The House's October Built is a unique film and one that has more history than you would expect. It opened my eyes to the fact that there was this gigantic haunt community I never realized existed. While I've said before that I'm not a huge fan of found footage, because most of the ones that I've seen were just lazy, this was not one of them. They took an idea that hadn't been done before and told it in a different way. As the film progressed, it was unclear as to how much was real and how far the Blue Skeletons would go. The cast was likable and relatable, unlike many found footage films where they want you to hate everyone. It was a smart choice to put Brandy in the lead because she was the standout star. I never once doubted her sincerity in the project. The House's October build is proof that found footage can be done without devolving into an endless parade of jump scares. If part two is as good as part one, I'm all in to see the next evolution to three and four. 